the webinar, Sonoma County Green Belts, Climate Resilience in Your Backyard, brought to you by the Laguna de Santa Rosa Foundation and our partners at Sonoma County Ag and Open Space and the Green Belt Alliance. If you haven't already, please do say hello in the chat and tell us where you're tuning in from today. You can find the chat box by hovering over the bottom of your Zoom screen. And you can also choose who you're gonna chat with um, right at the bottom where you would write your name. You have a choice of the panelists or everybody. My name is Christine Fontaine. I'm the Director of Education here at the Laguna Foundation. And I'd like to begin this place-based celebration with a land acknowledgement. A land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects indigenous peoples, people as traditional stewards of this land and the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. The Laguna de Santa Rosa sits within the homeland of the Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo people. To raise awareness for ancestral and current indigenous peoples presence in the Laguna watershed, we pay our respect to past, present, and future generations of Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo people and their Wapo neighbors. If you'd like to know more about the indigenous land you live on, you can visit native-land.ca to get started. The Laguna Foundation is a nonprofit organization based in Santa Rosa, California, that works to restore, conserve, and inspire appreciation for the Laguna de Santa Rosa. The Laguna is a 22 mile long wetland complex with a 254 square mile watershed that encompasses the businesses, infrastructure, farmland, open space, and people living in the Sonoma County communities of Santa Rosa, Katati, Bernard Park, and parts of Sebastopol and Windsor. The Laguna de Santa Rosa wetlands have been heavily impacted over time by development within its watershed and across the Santa Rosa Plain, and it now faces important issues that drive our restoration, conservation, and education work today. However, that's not the whole story. Despite the challenges, the Laguna is a biodiversity hotspot with the very special designation of being a wetland of international importance, one of only 34 sites in the United States with this honor. We conserve and restore these special wetlands by planting native trees, shrubs, grasses, and flowers, managing invasive species, and collaborating with our agency and nonprofit and community partners to improve the health of the Laguna. We increase public knowledge and appreciation of the Laguna through our Learning Laguna School Program, our Camp Thule Summer Program, and webinars like this. We do this important work with the support and partnership of organizations like Sonoma County Agricultural Preservation and Open Space District. They have preserved over 123,000 acres in Sonoma County to date. They have, uh, this open space helps our community be more resilient to extreme weather events and climate change, and many grasslands, forests, and wetland ecosystems within that 123,000 acres store and sequester vast amounts of carbon. This presentation and many more outings on the land are made possible with your support of the Ag and Open Space and Conservation in Sonoma County. We also partner with organizations like Greenbelt Alliance, which is a regional environmental advocacy nonprofit working to educate, advocate, and collaborate to ensure the Bay Area's lands and communities are resilient to a changing climate. Thank you to those of you that included a donation with your registration for this program. Your financial support is greatly appreciated. The Laguna Foundation relies on donations from individuals like you to continue our critical restoration, conservation, and education work. You can also donate securely on our website and I will include a link to that in the chat and in the follow-up email. This presentation is being recorded and will be available to view on our YouTube channel by early next week. Again, please feel free to talk with us in the chat and you can find that by hovering over the bottom of your screen and choosing who you chat with. All right, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers this evening. 
Sarah Cardona is the Deputy Director at Greenbelt Alliance. Sarah leads climate policy and advocacy initiatives, drawing from her prior experiences planning and implementing mitigation and adaptation, adaptation solutions at international, regional, and local levels. We're also joined by Sherry Emerson, who serves as the Stewardship Manager for Sonoma County Ag and Open Space. She currently oversees the stewardship of over 123,000 acres of land protected by Ag and Open Space to permanently preserve productive agricultural land, healthy watersheds, functional ecosystems and biodiversity, scenic landscapes and green belts, and to provide a wide variety of recreational opportunities for Sonoma County residents and visitors. Anne Mark Hill, the Executive Director of the Laguna Foundation is also with us tonight. She has worked in wildlife conservation for more than three decades, including 24 years as a wildlife biologist and refuge manager with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services National Wildlife Refuge System in Colorado, Alaska, Florida, and California. Here's the outline for our talk tonight. And we're gonna get started by going over some of the definitions uh, of the language that we're gonna be using this evening. So I'm gonna start to hand it over to Sarah, who's going to give us those, the, start off with the definition of green belts and the four categories of green belts. Sarah, over to you. Great. Good evening, everyone. And thanks, Christine. It's uh, really exciting to be here. We really appreciate the opportunity to join our partners and all of you here this beautiful evening um, to talk about this really important and timely conversation and a really rich conversation. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that um, we all learn something new here from our time together tonight. Um, so for those of us who are living here in the Bay Area, um, we are so lucky to have access to over 3.6 million acres of greenbelt. And um, for those of you who, who know Greenbelt Alliance and maybe have worked with us or partnered with us or gone on some of our outings um, with us, you know, we at Greenbelt Alliance have been working over the past 60 years or so to protect those lands um, through land use policies. But you might be here tonight if um, you're like many people that we might, you know, interact with at the grocery store out on the street, you know, what exactly is a greenbelt? And really appreciate those of you who've shared your thoughts about um, what greenbelt means to you in the chat. You know, I think we've heard um, it can be a, a creek side, absolutely, a riparian area. Maybe it's a ridge top. Um, I was thinking of, you know, a trail system that um, I want to go hiking uh, this weekend. And on this slide here, um, is, is the definition that um, Greenbelt Alliance has been operating um, off of um, in our work. And, you know, we generally refer to Greenbelts as the natural, the undeveloped, and or the, the agricultural lands that surround our urban areas. And these lands may include, you know, open spaces, parks, farms and ranches, um, wildlands or any combination thereof, and um, they are you know, des designated by cities, counties, special districts, and, and other jurisdictions. Um, so you can kind of hear in this definition, there's this general um, encompassment of different types and different scales of landscapes. Um, and in the next slide, uh, what we have more recently been researching and thinking about, and I'm going to get into a little bit later in tonight's conversation, is how can we um, really start to uh, ca categorize green belts? And um, this infographic that we've developed here, you know, takes that broad definition that we just reviewed, and it, it kind of compartmentalizes into four different categories that, um, again, I think it's really resonating with a lot of what what you all are sharing here in the chat. Um, so, you know, there's one green belt type that is the open spaces, the parks and the preserves um, that we all enjoy, you know, adjacent to or surrounding high uh, wildfire risk communities at times. Um, the second type, it, in contrast to that, are more of the agricultural and the working land. So 
that would include, we would call green belts, the, the vineyards, the, the systems or networks of orchards or farms uh, uh, across the region. Uh, there's a third type of green belts that um, we're calling here green belt zones that now these are strategically planned and placed inside subdivisions and communities, uh, not surrounding them. They can actually be designed and developed to be part of um, a neighborhood or community's landscape. And you know, lastly, a type of green belt that um, refers to those recreational greenways, um, the bike paths, uh, but even playing fields and golf courses. And so I'm going to talk a little bit later about um, more characteristics of behind each of these four types of green belts. But uh, that kind of sets the, sets the tone for us here tonight in terms of basically we're using one word, a green belt, um, to talk about a wide variety and diversity of, um, of landscapes. And I'm really excited to um, be here with Sherry and Anne and talk through um, all of the various wonderful benefits of these kinds of, of green belts that we have here. Um, before I turn it to the next speaker on this next slide here, um, just to kind of reminds us uh, to zoom out and look at across the vast Bay Area, the amount of green belt that we have, um, that we enjoy, as I mentioned, that 3.6 million acres. And if you are familiar with any other kinds of um, locations across the United States or, or cities, um, some cities and, and areas, you know, have one designated green belt. Well, here there, we don't actually have one single green belt, but there's this beautiful collection, as you can see on this map, of various types of landscapes. Um, so uh, a lot of partners went into uh, developing this map um, put out by the Conservation Lands Network you all may have, have heard of. And it really does illustrate this breadth of the protected lands um, that are our green belts across the region. And a little bit later, I'll actually be talking about the specific land use policies that really work to establish and to protect the green belts. I'm already seeing a question in the chat, you know, how, how do we balance the protection and also um, development that uh, the region needs um, so really excited to dig into um, more of these topics in today's conversation. Um, so that gives you sort of the, the, the groundwork for tonight and our uh, the regional view of green belts. And I'll now turn it over to Sherry uh, to talk about the green belts of Sonoma County. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to Christine and Anne for hosting this webinar. Um, Ag and Open Space, we greatly appreciate the invitation to join in and um, get to discuss such a wonderful topic. Um, we, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little more about Ag and Open Space as our organization and the work that we do a little later in the presentation, but we just wanted at this point to give you a sense of where the green belts are within Sonoma County. Um, kind of come zooming in from Bay Area, regional, down to county level, which is our, my organization's jurisdiction. Um, and you'll notice here, of course, that the classic idea of a green belt ringing an urban area or an urbanized area, um, unincorporated or incorporated, is kind of what we're seeing. So the green areas here and all up and down um, we, uh, the 101, we have communities and also to the west and the east. Um, and around each of those, it has been designated um, within my organization's strategic plan, which I'll tell you about a little later, um, about a mile, um, kind of a, a buffer the wet that we've identified as a priority greenbelt area. Um, and I love what Sarah said about broadening that definition of what a green belt is, because it's not just right around the limits, you know, the city limits um, or the limits of a town or an urbanized area, but it's all of those spaces that cross and curve in between, um, whether they're designed into a community or, um, you know, the way the creeks flow from east to west across this area um, and then into um, the Laguna watershed. So what we wanted to do next is just give you a sense of zooming in further. Here we are, Laguna de Santa Rosa watershed, 
one of the most amazing places on earth. And it's um, fantastic that it's been recognized internationally. Um, but you can see again, we've got these green belt areas that are around the fringes of kind of more urban areas and specifically Santa Rosa, Windsor, Roner Park, um, and a bit of Sebastopol. But if we had the opportunity to zoom in even further, you would see all of the creek corridors. You see some of them here um, and all of the other green spaces that are within that urban area as well that do uh, count as green belts. Um, and one of the things that I'll tell you a little bit more about later is the work that Ag and Open Space does. Primarily, we protect land through acquisition of conservation easements. And you can see in the dark gray color that a number of those properties that we have been involved in the protection of and um, that other partners that we work with have been involved with um, are within green belts or near green belts or add to green belts because these places again, are very special. They provide a multitude of benefits. I think the next. Great, Great. thank you, Sarah and Sherry for getting us started with a look at generally at, at green belts and where they are in our region. Um, let's go to Anne what, to talk about the roles that green belts play in land conservation and climate change adaptation. Thanks, Christine. It's great to join you and Sarah and Sherry on this great webinar. Um, I just want to uh, touch on a number of benefits and roles that green belts play in land conservation and climate change adaptation. And I have some examples of most of these here. Uh, and also following my uh, general description, Sarah is going to come back and join us and focus specifically on a recent assessment that Greenbelt Alliance did with respect to green belts and wildfire resilience. So the first role that green belts play in land conservation and climate change adaptation is that they preserve biodiversity. And as been mentioned by others, Sonoma County is the second most biologically diverse county in all of California. And it really is thanks to the wonderful mix of both natural and working lands from the mountains to the coast. And here in the Laguna de Santa Rosa watershed, the expansive freshwater wetland complex itself uh, provide adds to that biological diversity. And as, again, as mentioned, it's been recognized as a wetland of international importance by the United Nations under their Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. And this region is a critical stopover for thousands of birds migrating along the Pacific Flyway and home to more than 200 species of birds from bald eagles to hummingbirds. It's also home to rare and endangered species, including the California, Cal Central California Coast coho salmon and steelhead, California tiger salamanders, and several plant species that I'll talk about later, as well as uh, diversity of mammals, such as mountain lions and coyotes and badgers and river otters that call the Laguna home. Another important <clears throat> benefit of our green belts is that they serve as connectors or corridors for wildlife. Resident and migratory bird species uh, are dependent on green belts. Uh, they travel from the Americas to overwinter in our forests and riparian corridors. Salmonid species use our connected habitats to move up and down stream for spawning and out migration. And a wide variety of terrestrial species, uh, such as the mountain lion and many others that have been captured on cameras and shared widely on social media, use these green corridors for shelter, food, and movement through our developed landscapes. And the, the next slide just uh, shows again our particular interest at the Laguna Foundation is on our wetland ha habitats. And this is a great graphic that shows the diversity of wildlife and also the uh, complex food web that is created, uh, demonstrating you know, the interconnectedness from the leaf fall that becomes detritus that's fed on by aquatic bugs that in turn become food for fish and water birds and ultimately become food for the higher level predators like our river otters and bald eagles. Next slide. Green belts are also important for both water quality and water quantity. Uh, these areas capture and store rainwater, they replenish our groundwater aquifers, and they also regulate the water quantity and supply by 
releasing water at the right time and the right place in the right amounts. And most importantly, they provide uh, for clean water by removing and absorbing pollutants. Wetlands in particular support a unique set of natural biochemical processes that absorb, transform, sequester, and remove nutrients and other chemicals as the water slowly flows through the wetlands and the riparian streams. The processes that lead to the uptake and retention of nutrients include plant uptake and storage in the tissues, microbial processes, and the physical process of sediment deposition. In addition to filtering out nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus, these processes also include sequestering carbon. Next slide. So carbon sequestration and climate resilience are other important roles that our wetlands and our grasslands and our forested green belts serve. According to the Ag and Open Space District's Healthy Lands and Healthy Economies study, our existing riparian corridors in Sonoma County alone are estimated to sequester about 1.84 million tons of carbon dioxide. And they estimated that with additional restoration, this could increase to 3.1 million tons of above ground carbon dioxide. And this, of course, is just one type of green belt, the riparian corridors. And so if you think about the other natural and working lands, uh, that again highlights the critical role of our green belts in carbon sequestration. And habitat restoration, as I mentioned, is increasingly recognized as a tool for combating climate change through its role in carbon sequestration, as well as its function as a natural infrastructure for adapting to increasing temperatures, for instance, providing shade, also protecting from natural hazards such as floods and wildfires, which are increasing in intensity and frequency due to climate change. Next slide. So this other role uh, is related to our local area. These uh, are, are, the Santa Rosa Plain is essentially a floodplain where waters come off the Mayacama Mountains and Sonoma Mountain and, fl and flow westward to the Laguna de Santa Rosa, which itself flows into the Russian River. And of course, your typical floodplain are made by rivers that are naturally meandering as it travels downstream, and in our case, travels northward to the Russian River. And when this happens, this leaves behind silt and other deposits and gradually builds up the, the floor of the plain. And this is a rich fertile habitat that is then becomes highly coveted by uh, agricultural interests and development. And in the past, we tried to control these rivers so that we could use the floodplain uh, by straightening the creeks and clearing streamside vegetation in an attempt to move the floodwaters more quickly. This has resulted in the unintended consequence of making flooding worse elsewhere. Example in the Laguna watershed by filling it with sediment and reducing its capacity to hold and convey the floodwaters. Next slide. <clears throat> Naturally vegetated riparian areas and floodplains maintained as open space can therefore reduce the force, height, and volume of floodwaters, <clears throat> floodwaters excuse me, <clears throat> by slowing the waters and allowing the water to spread out across the floodplain. This is a great example of that. Just recently, uh, this is, picture was taken from our Laguna Uplands Preserve in Sebastopol, looking eastward towards the Mayakamas Mountains. And you can see on the left, a uh, typical view of the Santa Rosa Plain. The, the Laguna is, is relatively dry during the drought, running uh, in the mid foreground. And after this last atmospheric river storm, that entire floodplain filled up with floodwaters and just demonstrates how open space, uh, including the city of Santa Rosa, Brown and Alpha Farms and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife's Laguna wildlife areas that are seen within this view, um, help uh, hold back the water. And it's reported that each acre of inland wetland can absorb up to one and a half million gallons of flood water. And specifically in the Laguna floodplain, it reportedly holds back enough water that it can reduce the flood levels on the lower Russian river below Forestville by up to 10 feet. 
Some of the other important roles are providing for food, recreation, tourism, traditional and cultural and spiritual values. So these intact natural green belts are also important for human well-being, for all of our um, health and well-being. These are areas for nature study, for bird watching and nature observation, for recreation, solace, and sustenance for present and future generations of Sonoma County residents. Again, according to the Ag and Open Space District's Healthy Lands and Healthy Economy study, Sonoma County residents make nearly a million visits a year to fish or view wildlife in our riparian corridors. These natural lands in the Laguna de Santa Rosa watershed are also the traditional homelands of our native peoples, the Coast Miwok, Southern Pomo, Wapo, and other native tribes of the region. And they remain important for sustaining cultural heritage, including traditional knowledge and stewardship of our natural resources, including the harvest of plants and animals for a variety of uses, such as the tulis in the upper left and acorns in the center. Now I'd like to pass the slides on to Sarah. She's going to focus on the specific role that green belts play in fire risk reduction and resilience. Great, thank you so much, Anne. And it's it's so refreshing to see just the breadth of benefits and, and the roles that green belts play in our daily lives and, and for our communities and society at large. And in that same spirit and, and in acknowledging even in just the last five years, right, we have really seen we're at a tipping point when it comes to wildfires here in the Bay Area, California at large. So Green Belt Alliance set out to uh, take a step back in terms of our understanding of all of those myriad benefits of green belts and ask ourselves, are there other critical roles that green belts can or do play when it comes to wildfire and reducing risk and in building our resilience? We had a hunch, but we, we set out to do some research to then inform our own on the ground, you know, local and regional advocacy. And so I'm in the next uh, series of slides, I'm excited to really share with you all um, what we have uncovered when we set out to connect the dots on how can we safely coexist with wildfire um, with uh, the powerful role of, of nature and of green belts. And in a white paper that maybe some of you have um, come across or joined us at our launch of that um, just in, in this past June, you know, we really compiled the evidence from original research uh, to make the case to our elected officials, to government staff and planners that we have a huge opportunity to prioritize all of these various four types of green belts, our open spaces, our agricultural lands, to build our resilience to wildfire. And so um, I'm going to dig into our findings, but again, to just um, remind you all of uh, our research really uncovered, again, those four different kinds and types of green belts, and they each had uh, a role to play in, in this wildfire risk, risk reduction story. So um, we can just uh, dive right into um, the, the key findings and, the one thing uh, that I remember coming up in, in our launch of this research, the question of, well, are, are wildlands or forest type landscapes a part of, of this research and our findings? And we're not, that it's, we're differentiating between, you know, these four different types of green belts are not the wildlands or the, the forest type landscapes, but really following um, those four types here, but ranging from our open spaces um, to our agricultural lands, working lands, um, to these various uh, strategically planned green belt zones, and again, to uh, recreational greenways and bike paths, walking trails. Um, and you can kind of see, see why that is when um, I go through the findings of our research. So thank you to uh, the next slide. Um, so uh, th these various green belts actually play a role in reducing the loss of life and home to extreme wildfire events. We um, did some original research, a lot of various deep interviews, even based off of some of the recent um, 2020 wildfires um, to really uncover and learn more about the role uh, of green belts. And 
Uh, the first finding that I want to share is that these green belts can serve as strategic locations for wildfire defense. You can imagine existing parks, uh, open spaces, or preserves um, near communities, maybe near where you are tonight, um, have often been used for firefighting um, as staging areas uh, for firefighters. So they are really providing that um, strategic space in, in during a, a wildfire. Our second finding is that uh, similarly, these types of green belts, here's a picture of, of the second type of more of an agricultural working land. This is a vineyard in Sonoma County, can act as a natural buffer, creating that distance and separation uh, from communities and the wildfires approaching. Uh, so, for example, you know, farm and ranch lands, uh, again, such as this vineyard, but it could be orchards, um, other food crops, or other cultivated plants. Um, what we we've documented and found is, you know, they do tend to be um, more resistant to wildfire due to their relatively high water content, um, and as a result, uh, that's an additional benefit. These agricultural lands can help to then slow, or even in in some cases, stop wildfires um, based on what we found. For our uh, third finding, um, this work that we uh, un uncovered um, and researched really showed us that, um, as we'll be talking about in more depth with the other panelists here, it isn't enough to just simply establish the green belts, that there is a critical role uh, as they are well maintained. Um, so again, our research found that if these it, landscapes are properly managed and stewarded, we found that these green belts can reduce the size and the number of extreme wildfires that threaten communities. Uh, moving to our um, next finding is that um, probably of no surprise to, to many of you here, um, when agricultural lands that uh, really reflected using the best management practices for regenerative agriculture, that really did serve an important role in increasing overall wildfire resilience. And it gets back to that stewardship component and land management component that I know we'll be digging into um, in a little bit. But that was a, a key finding that, that we found in, in this research related to wildfire resilience. I have two more findings for you. <laughs> um, this next one uh, really highlighted for us that um, uh, it, there is this connection between land use planning in high fire risk areas that would protect the lands around communities, right, from development, um, and that can many times uh, also be protecting areas that are really re species rich. Um, and so that land use planning has a higher return on investment, delivering both these wildfire risk reduction benefits that I've just been talking about, but also that uh, that win-win, that biodiversity conservation benefit. And in fact, when we do that and look at high wildfire risk areas, um, many times they can also be bio species rich and biodiverse rich, and we can have um, uh, two goals being met by that protection and stewardship of those areas. And our final uh, finding, just to share the highlights with you of that research tonight, is uh, back to that greenbelt type that is um, more strategically designed, right? The, the greenbelt zones that are planned or placed inside the neighborhoods, um, many times when they are uh, designed with um, fire resistant landscaping. Um, around clustered homes, that really did uh, provide risk reduction benefits when it comes to, to wildfires. And so again, is just another benefit of green belts uh, when we think about how are we going to confront the climate crisis in particular, um, coexisting with, with wildfires. Uh, so I'm doing a quick time check, and I think I, I do have an opportunity to, um, to bring this research to life a little bit more with um, two examples, because in, in the white paper, in our research, um, we actually uh, looked at and, and documented some illustrative examples and case studies. I, I feel like that's what makes it, um, you know, come to, to, come to life and, and more powerful. Um, 
And for some of these, they, they um, have been documented uh, for the first time um, in, in our paper. So would love to, and I think we've dropped the chat, uh, a link in the chat box. So definitely um, check that out if you haven't already. Um, and there are more examples like this in the white paper, but I just have two to briefly uh, share with you. And um, I think I saw a couple of you in the chat said you were uh, in or from uh, the town of Windsor. So this first one is situated in, in the town of Windsor in Sonoma County, and the natural and, uh, natural and agricultural lands that surround Windsor uh, helped to stop the spread of the Kincaid Fire in 2019, um, which definitely, you know, caused damage, but we believe, and, and we even talked to um, local uh, authorities, um, it, it could have been much worse if it weren't for that Greenbelt protection. And Greenbelt Alliance actually led the advocacy campaign um, back in 2017, uh, so just two years prior to, to that wildfire, um, to renew the city's urban growth boundary. I'm going to talk about urban growth boundaries in a little bit uh, later. But that key land use policy tool um, that protected then the, the Greenbelts uh, adjacent to Windsor from development actually was put to the test in the Kincaid Fire and, and really did make a difference. So that collective action and policy, uh, land use policy that protected those green belts, um, you know, really impacted that community's resilience to wildfire. So that's uh, that example. And just briefly, um, a, a bit more, more recently, again, we looked at examples back from um, the wildfire season of 2020. And, um, you know, unfortunately, the, the glass fire um, did, did tragically burn, uh, I think it's around 600 homes in um, Sonoma and Napa counties in, in August of 2020. Um, but again, we in kind of retrospectively doing the research, looking into it, the total devastation, um, we believe could have been uh, much greater if, if not for uh, the firefighters access to the existing open spaces and trail networks, um, uh, including a 5,000 acre um, Trioni Anadel State Park uh, in the area. So those existing trails, um, the fire roads, those were instrumental in preventing you know, more extreme loss of life and, and home. Um, and you can even see here, I believe this is a quote from one of our interviews um, that you know, establishing the hiking and biking trails um, really uh, did make, make a difference where, um, again, that natural wildfire buffer uh, allowed for a mounting of defense that stopped you know, the wildfire from spreading. So, um, those are to just you know highlight for you uh, you know our our recent research and findings and what we're using now in our local advocacy when we talk about um, the powerful role of green belts um, why we continue advocating for for more of their establishment protection and stewardship we have now an additional suite of benefits to us in terms of wildfire resilience um, to uh, motivate us to to uh, to do so. So with that, I think um, I'll leave it there and we'll turn to the next topic. Yes. Thank you, Sarah. It's so exciting to hear about the, the findings and we appreciate you sharing them with us and, and the advocacy work that Greenbelt Alliance is doing. Um, Sherry, can you talk about policies and other mechanisms that are in place for protecting Greenbelts? Sure. Um, I can start with talking about Sonoma County Ag and Open Space. Um, you know, our whole purpose as an organization is to permanently protect the diverse agricultural, natural resource, and scenic open space lands of Sonoma County forever for future generations. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about our organization, how we came to be and what we do. And then I believe Sarah will talk a bit more about some of the other tools and policies that are out there that help protect green belts. Um, you know, in 1990, when our organization was created by the voters of Sonoma County, there was a lot of concern about our area becoming rapid, you know, urbanizing quickly. Um, there was conversion of working and natural lands happening. There was a lot of concern that we were going to lose these open spaces that really um, defined the rural and just beautiful nature of our county. Um, 
So in 1990, um, the voters approved two measures, one to establish the organization and then one to fund it. This work, uh, this land conservation work that the organization was created to do is funded by a quarter cent sales tax. So a quarter cent of all of the sales tax dollars spent in Sonoma County go towards this work, uh, which is amazing foresight on the part of our community to put money away gradually and then um, result in just an amazing network of protected lands. To date, we've protected 123,000 acres. I think that's something like 12% of the county land area. So it's, it's, it's amazing and um, incredible what has happened here in Sonoma County. Um, our organization was initially funded for a 20 year period at sales tax and then uh, we were reauthorized in 2006 um, that with the extension of that sales tax that goes through 2031. Um, and we'll go to the next slide. Great. Um, that reauthorization included a specific expenditure plan, um, basically uh, uh, laying out how those sales tax monies could be spent, what should they be spent on, what type of landscapes are critical and important to protect in the county. And um, if you read through the plan, and I will give you a link to the Vital Lands Initiative, and this expenditure plan is in there verbatim, just look at the language and it's community separators and green belts, um, agriculturally productive land, um, biotic habitat areas, riparian corridors, wetlands, urban open space and recreation projects within and near incorporated and in other urbanized areas. These are green belts. This is a big part of what we were created to do is to protect land throughout the county, all different landscapes, all of our unique landscapes, but in particular, green belts are a key part of us fulfilling our mission. Um, next slide, please. I mentioned briefly earlier the Vital Lands Initiative. This is a, a strategic plan or a policy that was approved um, in uh, at the start of 2021. Um, by the Ag and Open Space Board of Directors who are the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors, same five folks in a different role um, overseeing our organization. And um, this policy essentially that they approved directs our land conservation, land protection work into the future through 2031. Um, and we set out um, a number of very ambitious goals um, and these are those goals listed here, um, agricultural lands, community identity, healthy communities, water, wildlands, all of these goals were critical to land conservation, um, succeeding in terms of land conservation in Sonoma County. But if you look at them carefully, you'll start to see that um, green belts play a huge role in every single one of these goals. These lands are critical to protect for us to meet these ambitious goals for the county. Um, most of the projects that Ag and Open Space works on are multi-benefit. We try to re meet as many of these goals as possible with each of our acquisitions, each of our projects. Um, and in particular, green belts help us do that. A closer look at one of the goals that's really um, specifically kind of mentions green belts, uh, the community identity goal. Uh, protect open lands that surround and differentiate the county's urban areas and contribute to the unique scenic nature of the county. So um, if you'll see there, the specific objectives to that goal include greenbelt areas, unique and scenic landscapes, lands that provide visual relief from urbanized areas. This is um, a huge part of what greenbelts can do for us in our county. And this photo is of the Montini uh, open space preserves near at the edge of uh, the city of Sonoma in a green belt. <laughs> um, one of the many projects that meets and multiple goals um, of the Vital Lands Initiative. And the next slide. Here's just a few of the benefits that green belts can provide um, as part of these projects. This is a photo of the trail at the Montini Open Space Preserve. It's just a lovely place to visit, just steps away from the city um, downtown area. Um, 
And I won't go into detail here, but because others have covered the benefits, but um, just to, to underscore the importance of these areas for our community. And uh, I think that's it for me. Oh, um, and I'm gonna hand this over to Sarah to talk a little more about what some of the other um, policies and mechanisms are that can protect green belts. Great, thanks, Sherry. Um, well, to sort of highlight and, and continue on this theme of uh, Sonoma County's leadership and um, uh, foresight in, um, in these conservation efforts uh, from a policy standpoint, um, those of you here tonight may or may not know that Sonoma County is also one of the nation's best examples of how to work together to preserve agricultural land, open spaces, promote city-centered growth through a, a land use policy mechanism. Uh, there are two that I'll be talking about today, but the first one here is um, urban growth boundaries. Now you've heard us talk about that um, here and there through, throughout the night so far. Um, and uh, UGB is um, that definition really is that boundary um, that separates the urban areas from the surrounding natural and agricultural lands or green belts. And it will put a limit on you know, how far out the city can expand. And in that way, it is really an important uh, land use policy mechanism that really guides a, a local government's land use decisions. And um, the UGBs are, are often set for um, a limited period of time, uh, such as 20 years. And um, for those that are, um, when they're established, uh, they are voter uh, approved. Um, that means that um, only, you know, by a vote of the people can they be changed. Um, and so what's really interesting is that all nine of Sonoma County cities have those voter approved urban growth boundaries um, to prevent the sprawling out uh, of development into the green belts um, without a vote of the people. So um, UGB is a, a, a critical you know, land use um, policy mechanism. And on the next slide is, um, on the right hand side is a sort of a zoomed out <laughs> a view of all of the various um, uh, urban growth boundaries um, within Sonoma County, kind of hard to see, it's hard to get them all on one map there. Um, and then uh, I'm sure a lot of you have also heard about um, uh, the mechanism that is uh, commonly referred to here in Sonoma County of community separators. Uh, now, for those who might not know about this, we are not really talking about separating communities, but rather protecting them through the power of nature and through um, these policy overlays that, again, prevent the natural and agricultural lands between cities from being converted to development without a vote of the people. And so the purpose of the community separators is really um, threefold. Uh, you know, they serve as the green buffers between cities and towns. Um, they contain that urban development and preserve the rural charm of Sonoma County's landscape. And um, across the county, uh, the community separators here of Sonoma County actually cover, I think I'm looking at my number here, 53,576 acres of unincorporated natural and agricultural land. So um, these uh, complement the city's urban growth boundaries, right? Those boundaries that are around actual cities and, and demarcate the city the city growth limits. Um, so community separators, urban growth boundaries, and they complement one another's uh, by also then safeguarding the adjacent unincorporated lands. And I um, want to uh, just put, put a pause to again reflect on um, these mechanisms and how they have been so instrumental um, across uh, Sonoma County over the years. And, um, you know, one of the most important uh, green measures in Sonoma County in recent years, maybe many of you had uh, remembered voting for, or, uh, for this, was Measure K um, to really renew the voter protections for the community separators. Um, and for another 20 years. And so, uh, of course, you know, Greenbelt Alliance was um, very much involved in, in that effort. And um, it, it passed by more than 70% 
of uh, the countywide vote. Um, and so that was uh, re renewed. Um, and now, you know, thanks to Sonoma County voters um, voting yes for Measure K, it, you have renewed the community separators for another 20 years. So between um, urban growth boundaries and community separators, uh, keeping uh, our, our green buffers, our green belts um, intact. Uh, it's also really critical, this other piece to this puzzle um, up on the slide here, to promote our climate smart development, where we can uh, create those thriving, resilient neighborhoods um, with ready access to transit and housing choices, um, uh, within our existing cities and town footprints and, and not um, sprawling to our green belts. And so this uh, slide just um, reminds all of us, and, and I wanted to highlight you know, to, to everyone here that um, in tandem with Greenbelt Alliance's work to um, protect and steward and establish green belts through these land use policies, we also drive for climate smart development and have an endorsement program which really provides the support for the, the projects that are happening you know, across the region that advance the right kind of development in, in the right places. And um, these types of infill development projects uh, are, are critical to our conservation goals and our climate change goals. And I just wanna take a moment to um, give a, a nod to a recent um, project that we endorsed um, right in, in downtown Santa Rosa, the Journeys End Development Project um, that, you know, we were really excited to endorse. And then we were really proud to see that um, the city of Santa Rosa subsequently approved this um, project. So bringing it um, online uh, to have climate smart and inclusive housing um, in the North Bay. So uh, this particular project, um, for those who maybe haven't heard of it, uh, it's an infill development project by Burbank Housing um, at off of uh, uh, right in downtown Santa Rosa. And what's interesting is it is a, a development that will bring on, look at my number here, 532 housing units. Uh, 162 of which will be senior affordable units, um, but it also has one of the greenbelt types in its design that strategically plan in place greenbelt zone because it will include a one acre uh, central park that will be open to the public, um, for, again, providing those greenbelt benefits right even in an urban setting. So um, hopefully, you know, these types of tools and mechanisms and really the local um, land use policy decisions that we all are making and, and you all can influence um, really make a difference in bringing together uh, a, a climate resilient um, and, and sustainable uh, community and, and natural and working lands landscape for, for all of us locally and across the region. So. I uh, wanted to just uh, highlight some of those uh, mechanisms and uh, turn it over uh, to the next speaker. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, and Sarah mentioned earlier that it's critical that green belts are well maintained. So will you talk to us, share with us about some examples of ongoing stewardship and land management on green belts in the Laguna watershed? Sure, thanks for that question. Go to the next slide. I first I want to acknowledge that here at the Laguna Foundation, our mission of restoring and conserving habitats in the Laguna de Santa Rosa watershed are really can't aren't possible without our many partnerships uh, with both public and private land managers. And a lot of our work is actually helping them to restore and conserve habitats on their properties. Um, and protection of our green belts does require ongoing management and stewardship. So once the, the legal and the regulatory mechanisms are in place, we've got conservation easements or the lands actually acquired and fee title uh, by public agencies. Stewardship is critical in maintaining and enhancing these habitats. And for example, some of the work that the Laguna Foundation is engaged in, uh, at the bottom of the slide, uh, a number of our natural areas are overrun by invasive plant species like the Himalayan blackberry. And this is a, a project along Hessel Creek, uh, south of Sebastopol, where we physically remove the H Himalayan blackberry 
opened up the understory and replanted native sedges and grasses and forbs. Um, and in other cases, we actually will restore the overstory with native trees such as oaks and ash and opens up these areas to a more uh, natural functioning. Some of the other um, sites that we work on, we focus on unique habitats that support rare species such as the Pitkin Marsh Lily at Cunningham Marsh and even working up on Hood Mountain with the Sergeant Cypress. And I'd like to spend a few moments actually focusing on our work conserving the remnants of the iconic vernal pool and oak grassland habitat that once covered the Santa Rosa Plain as a demonstration of why green belts are critically important and why stewardship itself is necessary to sustain these areas, particularly as the climate's changing. And the name green belt conjures up, you know, connected corridors or beltways. And there are also these patchworks of disconnected but still important kind of postage stamp habitats across this larger landscape. And uh, vernal pools is a classic example of this. They're a unique ecosystem that's rich in rare and endemic plants and animals and includes four federally listed endangered species, including the California tiger salamander, uh, the white flowers, the Sebastopol meadow foam. Uh, we have two yellow flowers that are the Burke's Goldfield and the Sonoma Sunshine. And many of these rare plants and animals have a restricted range and fragmented habitats, uh, which are particularly vulnerable to climate change. And these species, they can't merely move upslope or uh, onto the next property to find cooler or wetter conditions. And if these uh, species are to survive, they really need healthy metapopulations that are spread across multiple vernal pools and properties so that if one location becomes too hot or dry or impacted in some other way, we can still maintain healthy populations of these species. Uh, we, we currently manage in partnership with uh, public and private landowners about 132 acres spread across many sites in the Santa Rosa Plain. And we're starting a climate resiliency project at five of these properties in partnership uh, with the landowners, including Ag and Open Space District. Uh, for instance, on this map, uh, we show the five areas, the Sonoma Valley Regional Park, Heritunian South, which is the actual picture up on the upper left is a, an Ag and Open Space property just off of Highway 101. And then we're also working with um, some other properties that are protected in conservation easement and, and managed by other entities. And wetland ecosystems in particular are driven by the timing and the duration of inundation. So they're particularly, particularly vulnerable to drought um, as well as the other extreme of flooding that are predicted as a result of climate change. And the biggest threats to our vernal pools are habitat loss, this changing climate, and uh, the lack of suitable management and stewardship. The local Native American tribes managed this plain, uh, Santa Rosa Plain with prescribed fire and later early European settlers grazed the fertile plain. And this management actually allowed for a diverse mixture of native and endemic wildflowers to flourish. In the absence of active management, the incursion of non-native grasses causes our pools to dry down more quickly, particularly under our hot dry conditions and creates thatch like you see in the upper left-hand corner, which accumulates in the pools and smothers those native forbs. So that native, that thatch is also a threat to vernal pool species because it's, um, it's a buildup of fine fuels that increases the risk of wildfire, not only to the native habitats, but to those adjacent communities, um, human communities. So um, in this slide also, I wanted to demonstrate, and I have an alarm going off, I'm gonna turn it off, sorry. Um, to improve the, the ability of the Santa Rosa Plains vernal pool ecosystem, is to manage these properties um, here, for example, uh, managing the non-native grasses and the buildup of thatch in a variety of ways. Some of it is just uh, hard work of mowing and hand raking. We're also using uh, grazing with uh, sheep and the potential for using prescribed fire. And this will result in benefits to these areas as wildlife corridors for waterfowl and salamanders 
helps prevent uh, wildfire uh, potential in the grasslands and prevent the premature drying of the pools, which will thus increase the drought tolerance. Um, additionally, we'll be protecting these uh, heavy, healthy meta populations of two endangered plant species by collecting seeds, uh, bulking the seeds in their native plant nursery, and then replanting these locally collected seeds into previously occupied pools. And this will help us realize this landscape resilience, ensuring the genetic diversity of these plant species and conserving biodiversity, both at the local pool level, as well as across this larger meta population scale. So those are some examples of the type of stewardship that we're engaged in that are important for these lands that are protected as green belts in the Sonoma County area. And I wanted to follow up um, uh, as well to talk a little more about the work of Ag and Open Space in terms of stewardship and land management, um, specifically in green belt areas. Um, the way that we are use sales tax funding to protect land is one, we'll buy fee title um, to a property to protect it and manage that property on an interim basis until we find its permanent home. Um, transfer it to another entity, maybe a regional park, a uh, state park or other organizations, sometimes a nonprofit organization or a city or a town um, for permanent management. Um, into the future. And we, whatever property that we are involved in protecting, we always retain a conservation easement. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about that here just briefly. Um, the conservation easement is, uh, it's essentially, it's an agreement. It's a, like a contract. It is restrictive in nature. It's an agreement between two parties, the uh, willing landowners only is um, who we're working with in Sonoma County uh, through this organization. Um, other organizations receive donations of conservation easements, but the idea of this document, this agreement, is that it restricts the uses um, on a piece of property in writing to meet a conservation goal. A conservation purpose is how it's stated in the conservation easement document. And there are certain uses that are no longer allowed once this easement is in place. And it is a partial real interest in the property. So it does have an appraised value. Um, and so Ag and Open Space, most of the acreage that we've protected in the county is now held by us in conservation easements. There's an underlying landowner who owns and manages that land going forward, uh, but Ag and Open Space is charged with the stewarding of the easement itself. What does that mean? Well, essentially, we want to make sure that the taxpayer investment of sales tax dollars is protected. So if we protected a property, purchased an easement, or purchased fee title and transferred the property over and retained an easement to another landowner, we want to make sure the conservation purpose of that protection lives on in perpetuity. Um, the thing about conservation easements is they run with the land. No matter who owns the property, that conservation easement is permanent. It's always in place. So it helps us meet that mission objective of, um, you know, permanently protecting the unique landscapes of Sonoma County for future generations. And so to steward those easements, um, our staff will, will establish the baseline property conditions and then we'll return to the site um, on a frequent basis, if not every year, every couple years, um, to check how things are going. Can we provide any supporting information to the landowners? Can we help them um, connect them with best practices, other organizations that provide information about best practices or um, other kinds of potential funding opportunities to help them manage their land the most effectively and help them meet their goals for their property, all in the name of, um, you know, implementing the best practices on the land for uh, towards meeting those conservation purposes um, that we originally stated when uh, we helped protect the property. Um, and so, sorry, I just lost my place over a second. So in two ways that we're involved in the ongoing um, care uh, of 
properties and in particular green belts. The 1200 acres that Ag and Open Space owns and manages ourselves, actually, when I was thinking about it, those 1200 acres are all within what could be considered or would be considered if you look at the four categories that Sarah outlined as green belt properties. One is Haratuni and South, the property that uh, we're working on with the Laguna Foundation with the Vernal Pool Project. Um, and then the easements, the map that I showed earlier, many of those easements are actually within what would be considered a green belt as well in this broader definition. So hugely important tool to help um, continue uh, encouraging best practices on the land in those areas. Um, right. Sherry, we're gonna start with you. And if you could talk about some next steps or what are some ways that people can be involved in the work of protecting um, green belts? Sure. Um, Let's see, I think we have a slide up here. Um, one, of the, one of the things that was so incredible about being a part of the development of the Vital Lands Initiative, that strategic plan that um, our organization put together with the help of so, so many others. Um, this document is a, you might say a blueprint or a green print uh, for the future of land conservation of our county. What is it gonna look like? What is it going to include? How are we going to be more resilient to all of these changes that we're seeing in the climate? Um, it, it's an amazing document. It's based on the best available science and it is, there's so much information behind it and so much community input that went into that document. Many of you attending this webinar, participating in this webinar, were intimately involved with the creation of that document. And for that, we are so thankful. I would encourage anyone to visit our website to get take a closer look at that document. What does it say about green belts? What does um, it say about all of the benefits that have been talked about today? Um, and to at our organization, we're doing our very best to get extremely efficient, extremely um, focused on implementing that ambitious plan and um, all of the goals, but in particular, we're working on implementing the protection of green belts. And then I would also encourage folks to learn more in other ways, attend local walks, um, public outings, education programs, listen to more webinars like this one, these organizations that I'm um, so honored to be with and uh, you know uh, be talking with today, uh, they do tremendous work. And I think the more you can learn about your lo local organizations, um, the more that green belts will benefit. And then go see a green belt and drive by or get out of your car, go visit a city, a regional or a state park, or go to your local farm. Be a part of your local CSA, community supported agriculture. There's so much going on in green belts, especially in Sonoma County. And I and we'd encourage you to just go and experience this is a photo um, taken at Taylor Mountain, and it's just a fantastic greenbelt property right on the edge of Santa Rosa and Runner Park. And support what's happening on the greenbelts by local food or other agricultural products. There's so many working farms and ranches that are on greenbelt properties that are hugely important to our economy and to our um, the heritage and um, history in this community. So. I would greatly uh, encourage that as well. Yeah, I could share some examples too uh, from the Laguna de Santa Rosa Foundation. Of course, we have a robust community education program of which this webinar is a part of that, both virtually and in person, um, and even more so as we uh, get past COVID. But we've got lots of walks, talks, and classes, and we have hands-on stewardship opportunities. In fact, November 13th, we have a Laguna Stewardship Day at Irwin Creek. Irwin Creek flows through a stone farm, which is a property that's owned by the city of Santa Rosa and is protected with a conservation easement uh, by the Agon Open Space District. And Irwin Creek flows into the Laguna de Santa Rosa just off of Occidental Road to the north of Sebastopol. So please come join us for that day. And some other opportunities are to volunteer. We have garden volunteer days, uh, uh, 
robust opportunity to support our four acre native plant demonstration garden at the Laguna Environmental Center. Uh, encourage everyone to support green belts by planting natives in your own backyard because that's where invasives often come from or from uh, uh, the, the developed areas and help clean up trash in your creeks and green belt areas. Uh, every little bit helps. So we really appreciate it. And you can learn more about these opportunities to volunteer or attend our education programs at the lagunafoundation.org. Sarah, can you talk to um, Greenbelt regionally? Are there things that we can be doing in Sonoma County that not only support our Greenbelts here, but also support Greenbelts on a larger scale? Great, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll close by sharing some uh, next steps and things that you all can do to act locally, but really think regionally. And, and that's certainly at the heart of uh, what Greenbelt Alliance does. Um, when we're educating, you know, advocating, collaborating with all the partners here today and all of you in the land use decisions that, you know, start right in your backyard um, as a, a part of your neighborhood and community that has the critical connections and impacts to the watershed that you are situated in, like the Laguna de Santa Rosa watershed and its green belts that we talked about here tonight. And, and that you can imagine how that is then nested in a particular county like Sonoma County, which then of course really serves to play a significant part of the wider Bay Area region. So um, thinking about all of those various scales and, and how they're, they're so connected and where we can protect and steward our lands and grow our cities really does have that um, ripple effect regionally. So one of the tools that um, Greenbelt Alliance is so excited to be launching actually uh, just next month, December 7th, is a, a way that we all can play our critical part in protecting green belts um, region wide. And so stay tuned, please join us. We're so excited for uh, the launch of our resilience playbook. This is going to be um, your go-to guide for accelerating uh, our equitable adaptation to the climate crisis across the Bay Area through the power of nature, through the role of green belts for it, their myriad uh, benefits that we talked through today, not just wildfire, but the that carbon sequestration, that flooding um, and groundwater recharge and all of those benefits. Um, so this, this playbook um, is going to be an easy to use web-based format It'll be an online version um, where we have curated the strategies, um, the resources, the toolkits for those of you at home who are um, looking to take more action at, at your local level and regional level in advocating for um, how we should be uh, protecting green belts, establishing green belts. And so um, we uh, launched this as a, you know, a, a tool to support that local decision-making and exactly how we want to um, you know, really benefit green belts region-wide. Um, so please stay tuned for that. I think we um, you know, will share some information in the chat for you to join us uh, there. Um, and this next slide just previews a couple of other ways that um, you can take action. So uh, you, we've mentioned throughout the course of tonight um, policies, uh, some of which have been uh, uh, put up to the voters. Uh, uh, and so um, next year, 2022 in particular, I'm hearing is going to be a big one for um, local regional policymaking. And so those local ballot measures um, are ways that you have your voice um, and you can make it heard to uh, really show your, uh, your support for um, the importance of our open space and our water. Um, so local ballot measures um, that uh, really can help us create our thriving, resilient communities um, and protect our green belts, prepare us for climate change. Um, so definitely register to vote if you aren't already. And actually Greenbelt Alliance puts out a voter guide um, when we uh, come up to those uh, local ballot measure election cycles. So um, we put out our recommendations for, for uh, the critical climate related measures. So you can check that out as a resource. Um, 
when it's not an election cycle, you can also uh, partner with us in taking that um, local and even regional action um, in advocacy. Sign up for our action alerts where um, we will let you know uh, critical decision making points uh, that are coming up uh, around our open spaces, around our green belts, our agricultural lands, um, so that you can send emails to your elected officials um, and let them know uh, that you support uh, these kinds of uh, climate smart decisions uh, that impact our communities and our environment. And I definitely wanted to let this community know um, and uh, would hope that you could help us spread the word. We are actually hiring right now. We're looking for an addition to our team uh, for a resilience manager um, uh, located in the North Bay, Sonoma County, actually, um, who can join us in uh, working with multiple partners like the ones here on this uh, event, uh, work with local leaders to uh, advocate for climate justice and our equitable you know, nature-based solutions to climate change, including um, protecting and stewarding for the long haul, um, all of the various green belts that we've talked about here tonight. So um, please join us to spread the word as we're looking to grow our family and our team. Um, and so I just, this has just been such a, an inspiring event, uh, at least for me, just as a, again, a reminder of, you know, how interconnected um, we are uh, regionally and uh, even down to, you know, our human level, uh, to our natural landscapes and our, our green belts. Um, and they need a holistic approach for how we can conserve them and, and how they can in turn help protect us in, in this changing climate. And so um, I hope that this has also inspired you to take some, take these next, any host of these next steps um, to create a greener future for our, our ecosystems and uh, our green belts and the people that um, uh, live among them and benefit from them. So with that, thank you so much for tonight and this opportunity. Yes, thank you all so much. Um, can we take a couple minutes for questions from the chat? That'd be great. Um, Sarah, there's one that came up that I think you might have just touched on when you talk about voting and action alerts, but one that came in early um, was how can we stop governments sacrificing greenbelt lands to development? Sure. Well, I, you know, it goes back to, um, as I mentioned, uh, that multi-pronged approach to our puzzle here of uh, protecting and stewarding the green belts and promoting that climate smart growth. And, um, you know, we, as we are facing the climate crisis, we all know here as Californians and uh, living in the Bay Area, we're facing a housing crisis as well. And so it's really working with our local governments and our, our planning staff. Um, you, can, you can use our, our resilience playbook that will give you some specific language. And then speaking up during uh, cities and counties updating their general plans. Um, every city and county will be updating its housing element next year in 2022. That's where are they going to accommodate the number of housing, um, those developments, right, that we, we need to come online. We have a, a housing crisis that we know we can confront. And, um, and, and so it's really um, bringing forth those strategies that are uh, city-centered growth, infill development, um, while at the same time, elevating those policy tools that we've talked about here tonight, and the importance of um, the benefits of preserving and protecting and stewarding those green belts. Uh, and I think the more that we can um, be advocating for both simultaneously, I think can help cities meet these um, dual, dual goals that we have. Of how, how are we going to continue to adapt to climate change? How are we going to continue to um, uh, dig ourselves out of um, this housing crisis? So check out the playbook for even more specifics of how you can have that kind of conversation in your local community. That's going to be a great resource for us all. Thank you so much for giving that, giving us that um, sneak peek that it's coming. We can get excited about that. Um, all right, one other quick question from the chat. Um, and our, folk, our talk was really focused on the Laguna watershed. Uh, but there is a question from the chat about what about green belts and green belt corridors in West Sonoma County? Sherry, maybe you can talk about that a little bit more.
It, there are, like I mentioned previously, and um, I think you may have seen on the map, there, there are green belts throughout the county, um, absolutely. And um, if you think about the broader definition that was presented, the broader category of green belts, um, they'll be in every community and every, um, really touch every part of the county. It's this sense of, you know, connect, connected and connectedness, um, whether that's around communities, between communities, or through communities, um, riparian corridors, streams, floodplains, um, all the way out through the river areas to the coast. So um, all of those areas are critically important for um, a healthy county uh, for all the reasons that we've mentioned already. Ag and Open Space is involved with projects throughout the county, like I mentioned, um, West County and every 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 corner of the county. Um, traditional green belts definitely around more urbanized areas, but yes, if you think of that broader definition, um, we're there too, um, and they definitely play a role. And I I would also say that the the report that the Green Belt Alliance did on the wildfire resilience is incredible. You really need to take a close look at that. Um, many of the areas in West County that we've talked about that are at risk of fire. Um, I think it's important to think about the green belt and open space areas there that can help protect some of the smaller communities like Occidental and others. So um, I'd highly recommend you checking out that report. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. Okay, great, thank you. So some people were asking about how do we save the chat? Well, I, I want to let you know that I will be sending a follow-up email. We have recorded this presentation and I will be uploading it to our YouTube channel in the next few days. And I'll send you a link to the uploaded webinar. And I'll also include the references um, that were cited throughout the chat today, all of the reports and um, strategic plans that, that we talked about this evening. So have no fears, you'll get all of the links. Um, and uh, so keep your eye on your email for that follow-up message, probably early next week. All right, well, thank you so much to our panelists, Sarah Cardona, Sherry Emerson, and Ann Morkill for sharing more about what green belts are. I think we can maybe get stuck when we hear just the term green belt that, is, that it is only one thing. Um, but I love the idea of thinking about green belts being in our communities as well, that even our local parks um, make, a, make a big difference. Um, and that, that all of these, these spaces, when they're connected, really have ripple effects. Um, so thank you for helping us expand our thinking about green belts as well. Um, I hope that you'll consider joining us for our next webinar. Uh, it is an exciting one coming up on December 1st. It's entitled, entitled Our Wild Watershed, and it's focused on beavers. We're going to have a presentation with Brock Dolman and Kate Lindquist to talk more about beavers in Sonoma County and throughout the region. And you can find out about that on our website at lagunafoundation.org. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us this evening. Um, until then, be well. Good night. Thank you. <laughs>